great staff for us and the encouragement. And trust me, God will help us now in the coming weeks to continue what we already have heard. Thank you very much. Well, it's nice to be with you. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take a photograph. <laughs> Lee's keeping a, a record of some of the weirdness that we are currently going through. So we've got pictures of empty streets and whatever. So uh, I'm just going to you can wave. You can't smile, but you can before we begin proper. As you leave today, do remember to take your church newsletter. It can't be given to you at the start of the service, but please make sure you take one as you leave. Also, if you want one of our newsletters, we'll put them somewhere that you can take one of those. Well, we're already out there. Alright, okay, well, if Jeff's a better printed than ours, carry on. Okay, thank you. We're going to continue to think about what it's like to have faith in a time of crisis. Not your faith is in crisis, but faith in a time of crisis. And last week we finished with that well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And I trust you feel a sense of that in your own soul, that despite all that is happening and some of the, the weirdness, some of the anxiety that we feel, that actually deep down in our being we feel that sense of, well, it's well with my soul. And I want to begin with the true story behind that hymn. You may well know bits of it, you may know all of it, you may well have never heard it. But that old hymn was written by an American lawyer, a guy by the name of Horatio Gates Sparford, which gives you a clue that he's American <laughs> with a name like that. He was a lawyer, he was a Christian, and a very close friend of D.L. Moody. And he wrote the hymn following a, a number of extremely tragic and painful events in his life, which shows something of the reality that despite the crisis that came in his life, his faith was still strong. Back in 1861, he met and married a Norwegian lady called Anna Larsen. And five years later, they had their first child, a little boy. And with typical American uniqueness, they called him Horatio Sparford II. <laughs> but he died of scarlet fever, aged only four. And then one year after his death, the great fire of Chicago on the 8th of October 1871 really caused Horatio tremendous difficulty financially. He'd been a successful lawyer but he'd invested heavily in property in the area of Chicago that was very badly damaged. And his business interests were damaged even further by a an economic downturn that occurred two years later. And so he decided that he and his family, which now contained four girls, would go on holiday to Europe. D.L. Moody was preaching in the UK and Horatio and his family decided they would go and support him. And so they booked to travel on a passenger sailing ship called the Ville de Haan. But at the last minute, Horatio was delayed on business, and his wife and four daughters carried on ahead of him. But while they were crossing the Atlantic and just beginning to enter the English Channel, on the 22nd of November in 1873, they had a collision with a steamship called the Loch Burn. You may well have heard the expression, steam gives way to sail. That is meant to be what happens on the high seas. But on this particular occasion, the steamship did not give way and took off the bow of the Ville Hanf. It sank within 15 minutes. 226 people drowned. And only 87 survived. 26 
passengers in all. And all four of Horatio and Anna's girls died that night. When Anna, a few days later, landed in the UK, on the 7th of December, she sent Horatio a very famous telegram, which he kept in his study for many years afterwards, which contained the line, Saved alone, what shall I do? Shortly afterwards, Horatio crossed the Atlantic to reunite with his grieving wife. And as the ship entered the English Channel, the captain went and got him and pointed out the place where the ship had gone down and his daughters will have died. And according to his daughter Bertha, who was born some years later, after just looking at the sea, he went down in his cabin, he read Psalm 46 and wrote the hymn, or wrote the poem, of one stand in one standing, one sitting here. And his notes of that still exist. The tune, or the words, were put to a tune later on, and the tune is called Vilda Half, in the memory of the ship that sank. It's a hymn that speaks volumes about how he experienced real faith at a time of crisis. When sorrows like sea billows roll, it is well with my soul. But that is not the end of the story. It's the part that most people know, if you know the story, but it's not the end. Following this awful tragedy, they went on to have three more children, Bertha, Grace, and Horatio. But it was not the end of tragedy and sorrow in their lives. On the 11th of February, 1880, their second son also died, aged four, of pneumonia. And a year later, their lives took a major change. You would have expected them maybe to say, God, why has this happened to me? Are you really there? But a year later, they left America in 1881 with a number of other like-minded Christians and went to Jerusalem, a group that became known as the American Colony. They did a lot of things in Jerusalem at the time. But the Spafford decided that they would care for the poor, for the sick, and homeless children in the area. Their desire as a, a couple was to show something of the practical love of Jesus to those around them. It would eventually lead to them creating something called the Spafford Children's Center. It's still there today. Horatio died of malaria in 1888, but Anna continued to work in East Jerusalem until her own death in 1923. And their daughter, daughter Bertha, continued the work of the Children's Centre as well as writing a, a number of books. And for many years, the Children's Centre was the only children's hospital in the whole of the old city of Jerusalem still very active today and remains the only healthcare centre that treats families from all races, all faiths. The Spafford family left quite a, a mark on the world, certainly more than just a hymn. The reality of their faith enabled them to move forward because they had a sense of hope in Jesus Christ. Our first song is one that you will uh, know well. You may want to join in, come, stand, sit, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Stuart Town is there is a
Father God, we thank you that in times of anxiety, in times of despair, in times of confusion, we can come to you. And in those times, we find our Saviour. And we thank you that we are able to have a hope because of what you brought us into. We thank you that problems that are occurring now are just for a little while because we also have an eternal hope. An eternal hope that one day we will stand in your presence, faultless with great joy. Father, we realise we will do that not because of good in ourselves, but because you gave the Lord Jesus to die in our place and open up the way for us to know you in a real and personal way. We thank you for it. Father, we do pray for our world at the moment. Lord, we particularly pray for countries that are experiencing spikes in this coronavirus. We pray that you might give those in government and those looking after the medical side of things very real wisdom as to the decisions that they take. Lord, we pray for Beirut as it continues to get over the horrors of the explosion there. Lord, we pray that your people in those situations might stand up and be a light in those dark situations. And Lord, we pray that you might help us as a world to appreciate that all lives matter. Lord, we look on at concern at some of the things that are happening in the States. And we just pray that you might bring peace to that country that you might help them to learn to live in harmony and look past the colour of people's skins. And Lord, for our own nation, we just pray that you might give wisdom to the government, help them to make clear decisions to help us move forward from this current situation. And Lord, help us as churches, as we seek to be able to worship you and enjoy fellowship together in these strange times. said last week that the one thing that coronavirus could not stop was prayer. The entrance to God is available 24-7. You do not need a mask. You do not need to keep social distancing. You just march in. One of the things I've uh, done during lockdown was go to other churches. It's quite unusual for me to have the opportunity to listen to other people. And I quite enjoy it. And one church I went to was Zio Church in Hitchin. A funny name, it means life. Zio is the Greek word for life, life church in Hitchin. And the pastor there, Matt Summerfield is somebody I know, and they were talking about prayer, and I particularly wanted to hear what Matt had to say. But as part of their service, his uh, new wife, Anne Summerfield, did a very interesting A to Z of prayer. And I thought, I like that. So uh, I contacted Matt and I said, can I pinch that? He said, of course you can. So uh, just have a look at uh, the A to Z of prayer. We pray because we are his children and people belonging to God. We can ask and receive answers. We pray because God deserves our attention and adoration. Prayer increases our belief. We can bring any request. We pray because it's an opportunity to breathe in God and it's the best way to fight any battles. Why pray? Because we can connect with the God who loves to communicate through us. Because God cares and has compassion about every concern. We pray because it helps to convict us of wrong choices and behaviours. We pray because prayer is about discovering and developing deeper ways to become more like Jesus. And because prayer helps us to discern and declare truth over lies. We pray because God wants to share the details of our lives with him. Why pray? Because we can encourage ourselves in the Lord and seek encouragement over others. We pray because it enlarges our faith when circumstances look to belittle it. We pray because it expands a faithful relationship with Jesus. Prayer helps us to follow and fulfill a life that pleases Him. 
We pray because it gives glory to God and keeps our focus on Him. We pray because we all need help. Prayer helps us to stay humble before God. We pray because healings and happenings come through the power of prayer. Why pray? Because it moves us in a stronger identity in Christ. Because prayer invites God to show us the issues that need our attention. We pray because there is immeasurably and infinitely more of God to encounter. We pray because Jesus did it. And because it increases our joy when we spend time with our Heavenly Father. We pray because it's the most effective thing to launch us into a life of justice. Because prayer keeps God as King of our lives and invites his kingdom to break out in his world. Why pray? We pray because loving, learning and leading explodes through the habit of prayer. We pray because we need more of God and less of us. We pray because mountains can move when we pray and it keeps the main thing the main thing. We pray because there is nobody better in the world to talk and listen to. Prayer reminds us that we are not alone. God is always for us. Prayer, it opens up more opportunities than we can possibly imagine. And an obedient prayer life helps to oppose oppression. Why pray? Because God is worthy of our praise. Through prayer, we can encounter his presence, power and promises and peace. We pray because prayer helps unlock our purpose and reveals God's priorities. Persistent prayer always pays off. We pray because prayer helps us to learn things quicker. Because it gives us a space to bring our questions to God. We pray because it's our Christian responsibility and it's how we should respond to all of life's circumstances and struggles. You see, prayer helps to bring revelation to our minds and revolution to our lives. We pray because in prayer we can remind God of what he has already done. Not because he needs a reminder, but because we need to remember. Why pray? Because struggles can be shifted in prayer. Because strongholds can be broken. Because our salvation started with a conversation to invite God into our lives. That conversation needs to continue. We pray because time with God deepens trust in God. And this power in praying together is we seek God over our circumstances, culture and churches. We pray because it helps us understand the plans of God and unites us with heaven's purposes. Prayer helps us to visualize heaven on earth. Prayer. It keeps us vulnerable before God, focalizing our needs and moves us from victim to victim. Why pray? Because prayer shows us how to walk in his wonderful ways. Because we can grow to become worshipping warriors. And whatever happens, prayer helps us to remain thankful to God. Why pray? Because we are open to God's x-ray as he lovingly examines every part of our lives. We pray because our yuckiest and youngiest moments all matter to Jesus. We pray because we are a people of zeal. Prayer stokes our fire and passion for God, our zeal, inspiring and equipping us to be an unstoppable force in God's world. Why pray? Because the least we can do is the most we can do. Pray. I think that's pretty clever. I've also watched it a number of times and I get blessed by it differently every time as it just examines my particular prayer life and things that need to be uh, looked at. The first time you go through you think, I wonder what's going to be what? Or I wonder what's going to be X? And then, then the next time you see it you get past the yuckiest things. But uh, it's great to know that whatever comes our way, we can go to a faithful God who will be there for us. Have a sit this time and listen to a song that you know very well if you want to Come along, sing along, please feel free. Okay.
faithful one. You are there in times of trouble. Amen. I like that picture. It's on our dining room wall and it's good to uh, see it every time we have a meal. Last week we looked at the uh, lovely little encouraging, or started to look at the lovely little encouraging letter that Peter wrote to Christians that were experiencing the very first persecution. They were going through a very, very difficult time. And as we saw as he began the letter last week, he wanted them to be encouraged about the certainties of their faith. They were a chosen people. That before the foundation of the world, God had them in mind. They were people who had a, a living hope then in the midst of all the problems they were experiencing, they could put their hope in a faithful God. And despite the persecutions they were having, Peter reminds them that it would essentially be just for a little while. In light of eternity, it was tiny. He wanted them to remind them that they were receiving their salvation. They were gaining more and more of what it was to know God in a real and a personal way. And the things that they were beginning to experience and would experience in the future were actually things that even angels longed to experience and look into. And after those encouraging words to grab hold of the theology of our faith, Peter says to them, look, I want you to understand that faith is not a, a one-off decision. And then nothing much happens after that. It is a call to a new normal, a new changed life. A life that begins down here and ends in heaven. At the moment we are learning to live in the new normal. To keep two meters from people we want to be closer to. The deacons want to remind you, me to remind you at the end of the service to keep your social distance. You're not to be friendly to each other, you're only able to be two metre away friendly. Everywhere we go now, we have to wear a mask to keep us safe from the virus. Didn't used to be safe masks, but now they're wonderful. They can stop anything for the next few months anyway, until they change their mind. And when we go out and about, we have to use social distancing methods to make sure that we don't get too close to people. It's becoming part of our new life. Leave home with the wallet, the phone and the face mask. And as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be living a new normal. We need to be following God's guidelines. We need to be bringing Him pleasure and glory. How we're doing with that. And I wonder if Jesus were to come to our house, what difference our life would have to take, what differences would have to be introduced. Music 
and put some hymn books out. Could you let Jesus walk right in, or would you rush about? And I wonder, if the Saviour spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things that you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep its usual pace? And would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read? And let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends? Or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever, on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus came in person to spend some time with you. dated words because that poem was written in the 50s but it still has a, an element of challenge about the way that we live life the second half of this first chapter of Peter is a call to holy living hence it begins with the word therefore in light of all this good theological stuff that we want to enjoy how is that going to impact our lives I'm going to read from 1 Peter 1 verse 13 to 21 Therefore, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to faith, to come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God, because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. We're encouraged to call to holy living. In many ways, this section of the epistle, this few verses, is summed up in that little phrase in verse 16, Be holy, because I am holy. And if we don't grasp what Peter says here, we can't really understand what he goes on to say. He says, how we live matters. Peter quotes from Leviticus 11 and verse 44, where the children of Israel are told to consecrate themselves to God. God who rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He now wanted them to live in the promised land as his people, obeying his commandments. He wanted them to show by their lives that they were his people, that they were having their hope in him. He wanted them to be a people that marched to the beat of a different drum, as a witness to the surrounding nations. And Peter says that was true of the past, but actually it's true of us. In our situation, whatever we are going through, God says, I want you to live as my people. I want you to be different. I want you to be showcases for the gospel. But this 
text also raises a question. Can we really be holy in the same way as God is holy? The simple answer is no. Peter knew that very well. So what does he mean? You and I cannot be truly holy while we are still impacted by sin in our lives. We've been saved by God's grace. We've begun that journey of salvation. But as one of the old hymn writers put it, sin is still present to tempt and annoy. We are not perfect people. But Peter wants to make the point to them that actually the process of becoming like Christ has begun. It's begun because we've been born again that he spoke that I talked about last week. That's the start of the process that God is having in our lives. Peter here is talking about a process, not a fait accompli. He wants to see that the Christians here to understand that even through the tough situation they were going through, God was shaping them, molding them, making their faith sincere and genuine. Similar a bit to what Peter, what uh, Paul says in Philippians. He says this, not that I've already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, for I have press on to take hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. As I said last week, sometimes we can be guilty of looking back on the time when we came to Christ as thinking, well, I'm saved, I've crossed the line. And there is a sense in which our eternity is saved from that moment. But actually we need to remember that was the beginning, not the end. That's the day when we started the race. That's the day when we became disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the day when we became followers. And as disciples, as followers of Jesus, we need to set Christ as our example. We need to do what Jesus did. But also, Christ is our goal. He's what we want to be like. When we look at our lives, just like Paul in Romans, we say, well, I know what I should do, but I don't do it. I'm not the person I want to be, Lord. Help me to keep going. Help me by your spirit to keep changing. So how do we do that? Verses 13 to 15, Paul give, Peter gives us four demands. Firstly, he says this in verse 13, I want you to be mentally alert. Verse 13, in the NIV it says, prepare your minds for action, or think clearly in the New Living Translation. The old King James Version has a lovely phrase in this verse. It says this, gird up the loins of your mind. Loins are the name for that strange sort of dress that men wore in Bible times. And if you wanted to run down the shops or go into battle, you had to gird up your loins. And if ever you feel the need to gird up your loins, this is how you do it. <laughs> it was an expression that would have been familiar to them. It's a bit like we might say, pull your socks up or roll your sleeves up. It's that sort of an expression. And Peter is saying to these Christians, despite what is happening in your lives, make sure your mind is ready for action. It's a bit similar to what Paul said to Timothy. As Timothy was a new Christian worker. He was just told to do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. We need to be people who know the theology of our faith, but that we also know the promises of our faith. We mustn't be spiritually illiterate, but equally we need to have strong foundations for when life gets tough. That's what kept Horatio and Anna going. They were people who had a strong theology, but they also had 
strong sense of the foundations of their faith. From time to time, you and I will have an opportunity to speak up for what we believe. But can we? More and more today, we need to be able to prove why we believe what we believe. Why we practice what we practice. Why we do what we do. Are because. I wonder what are our views on things like creation, evolution, natural selection, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion. What are our views on those topics? That's often what people want to know about why we think, why we, what we think. If we have an opinion, is it a biblical opinion? We might disapprove of something, but can we give a, a chapter and verse for why we think like that? We need to make sure that we're well read. Occasionally reading books that we might disagree with. I quite often read books by Richard Dawkins. I totally disagree with what the guy says. But I want to know why he thinks the way he thinks. I want to know his because. And too much of our theology often comes from hymns. Or is handed down rather than being knowledge that we've gained from our own personal study. Peter, in his effect, saying to these people, Look, God gave you a mind, use it. You need to be mentally alert to live in the world for Jesus. Secondly, he says, I want you to be sober. The literal translation of Greek is don't get drunk. There is a clear instruction that Christians should not get drunk. But there's more to it than a comment about drinking habits. Modern translations tend to use totally different expression. The NIV says, be self-controlled. The New Living, exercise self-control. New American Standard Bible, keep sober in spirit. As Christians, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where we face temptations to conform and we need literally to take control of our words, of our thoughts, of our actions. If you see a drunk walking down the road, it's pretty obvious he's not in control. He doesn't have control of his thoughts, often his words, and often his actions. As God's people, we need to have. If we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, people need to see that we are not under the influence of alcohol, we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now we're in the process of being transformed. We're a work in progress and we will be till we step foot in God's presence. It's partly through our own doing, as Peter will say in the next chapter, rid yourselves then of all evil, no more lying or hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. Part of our changed life, we can control ourselves and we need to keep control of those things. But it's mainly through the work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, and that well-known verse says, Don't conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Are we letting God transform us? Maybe we've got a bit more time at the moment to allow God to do that. You had a glimpse of our land. It's been freshly decorated. Thanks to COVID. Bit of time to do a bit of decorating. Peter says we need to be sober. We need to be in control of our minds. Thirdly, he says in verse 13, be assured of your future. Set your hope fully on the grace given to you. Here were people who could live out strong Christian lives, who actually were in the process, some of them, of going to their deaths because of their faith. And so Peter says to them, set your hope fully on the grace given to you. Eat out to help out. We'll finish tomorrow. Tomorrow is your last time to rush down to your local restaurant of choice and have a half-priced meal. You may have been indulging every day, as I hear some people have been doing. Um, you may well have not done it at all. 
But I want you to imagine yourself in a really nice restaurant. You have enjoyed an absolutely brilliant starter. Whatever your favourite starter is, you've just had it. You've just had a wonderful main course. And you are now looking forward to the dessert menu coming your way. Based on what you've had so far, you think it's going to be good. It's going to be enjoyable. And so it is with the Christian life. The Christian life has, in effect, three courses. The starter is justification. When I made my first feeble steps towards Jesus Christ and said, I want you to forgive me and I want you to give me a new life. God said you justified. No, we didn't because I wouldn't have understood that at the time. The first part of our Christian experience to know that we are justified. That not because we deserve it, but because of what Jesus has done, we are made just as if we've never sinned. That God will look on Him and pardon me. Just for starters, I know that I'm forgiven. I know I'm brought into a new relationship with God. And then the main course comes along, and that's called sanctification. Now God the Holy Spirit moves into my life and does a, a work of changing and moulding and shaping me, of sanctifying me, of setting me apart and equipping me to be His person. And the sweet is glorification. The Bible says that when Christ returns or when I die, I am going to be changed. I am going to be glorified. We will receive incorruptible, immortal bodies. That is our confident expectation. That is a great thing to know if you are standing before an executioner. That's great if you know that your alliance did it. We are not experiencing persecution, but I hope that in hard times we appreciate our future. And fourthly, Peter says, be genuine. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You don't know any better then. You, sorry, you didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you. Is holy. Peter says, I want you to be on the outside what you are on the inside. When we become a Christian, we become a new creation on the inside. The problem is far too few Christians show it on the outside. Peter is reminding these particular Christians, now is the time to stand up and be counted. As I said, we're not being persecuted. But we need to stand up. Our country is in a shocking moral decline. We're a post-Christian country. And we're fast becoming a post-faith country. We need to heed Peter's words, which in the Good News Bible read like this. Be obedient to God. Be holy in all that you do. That way we will be the same on the outside as we are on the inside. Just to finish, I wonder, are you and I the real deal? I'm a bit disappointed with Boris. That's not a political comment. But I thought that he was going to be a Churchillian type leader. And I thought that when he took over from Theresa May, now we're going to have someone who gives clear direction, clear guidance. But actually he's let me down. Now it may well be because the guy is perhaps iller than we think he is. But he's not lived up to what I thought. And I wonder at the moment, as God looks at you and I, do we live up to what he wants us to be? At the moment, we have to wear a mask. It's not nice because you can't see people. But I wonder as people meet us, do they see a mask or do they see the real Christian? When they meet us, when they work with us, when they live next door to us, 
read our Facebook page, our Twitter feed, that they see someone who is a Christian? Are we living as a real Christian? Are we light in this current darkness? Peter would go on to say to these Christians in the next chapter, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. It's good for us to rejoice in those realities of our faith. As Peter's been trying to say, that you might declare the praises of him who called you and of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's be real this week as we interact with people in our various networks that they will see the faith behind the mask. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the foundations and certainties of our faith. We ask that you might help us to rejoice in them, to spend time thinking about them, to learn about them more. But Father, we realise that you just don't want us to become academic Christians. You want us to be changed people. That's why you put your Holy Spirit within us, to transform us. And we ask that you might help us never to give up on that transformation process. That we might be constantly be shaped and formed by the events that we go through. Lord, sometimes it's the hard times that actually bring out the best in us. Because we understand more of your faithfulness and your care. We understand that you are the rock. And we ask that as we interact with people around us, particularly people who don't know you, we ask that they might see the certainty of our faith. That they might see the hope that we have that they might see something of the joy that we have looking forward to. Father, we pray that we might indeed be lights in the darkness this week. Amen. Amen. Let's just finish with a song, I'm pretty sure you know it. It's called Yet Not I.
and who will bring you into his glorious presence, innocence of sin and with great joy. All glory to him who alone is God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, glory, majesty, power and authority belong to him in the beginning, now and forevermore. So at the start, if you want a church newsletter or one of ours, please help yourself at the back.